Good afternoon. My name is Latif, and I will be your conference facilitator. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to Intuit's first quarter fiscal year 2021 conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer period. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Kim Watkins, into its Vice President of Investor Relations. Ms. Watkins. Thanks, Latif. Thanks, Latif. Good afternoon and welcome to Intuit's first quarter fiscal 2021 conference call. I'm here with Intuit CEO, Susan Godarzi, and Michelle Clatterbuck, our CFO. Before we start, I'd like to remind everyone that our remarks will include forward-looking statements. There are a number of factors that could cause Intuit's results to differ materially from our expectations. You can learn more about these risks in the press release we issued earlier this afternoon, our Form 10-K for fiscal 2020, and our other SEC filings. All of these documents are available on the Investor Relations page of Intuit's website at intuit.com. We assume no obligation to update any forward-looking statement. Some of the numbers in these remarks are presented on a non-GAAP basis. We've reconciled the comparable GAAP and non-GAAP numbers in today's press release. Unless otherwise noted, all growth rates refer to the current period versus the comparable prior year period, and the business metrics and associated growth rates refer to worldwide business metrics. A copy of our prepared remarks and supplemental financial information will be available on our website after this call in. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Sasan. Great. Thanks, Kim. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. I uh, hope you're all doing well. We had a very strong start to fiscal year 2021. First quarter revenue grew 14%. Total revenue growth was driven by 13% growth in the small business and self-employed group. While consumer group and pro-connect group revenue was in line with our expectations in a seasonally small quarter. This is a great start to the year in a challenging environment, which reinforces the resiliency of our platform. We're growing more confident in how our business is performing in the current environment, although macro uncertainty remains. We continue to see recovering trends across our platform with many QuickBooks indicators back to pre-pandemic levels. Therefore, I'm happy to announce that we will provide guidance for fiscal year 2021, which Michelle will cover in more detail later. At our September Investor Day, we shared the acceleration of innovation driven by our AI-driven expert platform strategy and our five big bets, highlighting our growth potential. During the platform immersion experience, we demonstrated progress against each big bet. What I'd like to do is highlight a few of the innovations and cover big bet number one last as it accelerates innovation across our platform and is foundational to the other bets. Our second big bet is to connect people to experts. We're solving one of the largest problems our customers face, lack of confidence, by connecting people to experts with TurboTax Live and QuickBooks Live. We grew the number of TurboTax Live customers on our platform by nearly 70% last season, while increasing our expert product recommendation scores by four points. The team is hard at work as we prepare for the season ahead. We're also proud of the progress we've made with QuickBooks Live, which is built on the same expert platform. We already have more than 600 experts serving customers today, with some of these experts serving both TAPs and small business customers. Our third big bet is to unlock smart money decisions. We expect our pending acquisition of Credit Karma to be more important than ever as we work to help consumers save money, get out of debt, and have faster access to money. We expect to complete the acquisition before the end of this calendar year. Our fourth big bet is to become the center of small business growth by helping our customers get paid fast, manage capital, pay employees with confidence, and grow in an omni-channel world. 60% of small businesses struggle with cash flow. QuickBooks Cash helps small businesses manage working capital by providing visibility into their financial picture while providing them with the ability to move money instantly and ensure their money's working for them, all while leveraging the built-in accounting of QuickBooks. We launched QuickBooks Commerce in September to better serve the 1 million product-based businesses on our platform by providing inventory and order management tools they need to grow their businesses in an omni-channel world. 
We've also identified 6.4 million product-based businesses in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia that could benefit from this solution. And we'll innovate with high velocity to take advantage of this market opportunity. It's still early with both QuickBooks Cash and Commerce, but we're encouraged by what we're seeing. Our fifth big bet is to disrupt small business mid-market with QuickBooks Online Advanced and the features that we're introducing to individually tailor the offering to the needs of small businesses with 10 to 100 employees at a disruptive price point. We've doubled our QuickBooks Online Advanced customer to 75,000 in fiscal year 2020, and we're continuing to build on this momentum. We continue to pursue our premium app strategy and introduce integrations with Salesforce and HubSpot. We now have two of the largest CRM solutions available for our customers. And finally, our first big bet, revolutionized speed to benefit, enables us to put more money in our customers' pockets, eliminate friction, and deliver confidence at every touch point by using AI and customer insights. Last year, we increased use of AI and increased the number of models deployed across our platform by over 50%, tripled the speed of delivery on our modern development platform, and increased mobile application deployments by 60%. We're building on this momentum this year as we innovate rapidly to solve our customers' biggest problems. Across all of our big bets, we're building momentum and accelerating innovation, which we believe positions us well for durable growth into the future. We also believe the current environment continues to act as an accelerant to these bets. Most everyone is looking for virtual solutions. Small businesses are accelerating their shift to online and omnichannel commerce and both consumers and small businesses are looking for ways to put more money in their pockets. So to wrap up, I'm excited about the opportunity we have ahead of us, and now let me turn it over to Michelle. Thanks, Hassan. Good afternoon, everyone. For the first quarter of fiscal 2021, we delivered revenue of $1.3 billion, GAAP operating income of $209 million versus $10 million last year. Non-GAAP operating income of $334 million versus $129 million last year. GAAP diluted earnings per share of $0.75 cents versus $0.22 cents a year ago. And non-GAAP diluted earnings per share of $0.94 cents versus $0.41 cents last year. Turning to the business segments, in the small business and self-employed group, revenue grew 13% during the quarter. Online ecosystem revenue was up 24% during the quarter. Growth slow, slowed from Q4, reflecting the lagging impact of lower retention during fiscal 2020 and the lapping of price increases, which began during the middle of Q1 last year. Additionally, Q4 included four points of growth from non-recurring revenue from the Paycheck Protection Program. Our strategic focus within small business and self-employed is to grow the core, connect the ecosystem, and expand globally. Our longer-term expectation remains 30% or greater online ecosystem revenue growth, driven by 10 to 20% growth in both customers and ARPC. First, we continue to focus on growing the core. Quick online accounting revenue grew 28% fiscal Q1, driven mainly by customer growth and mixed shift. We began lapping a partial quarter of a price increase last year, driving slower year-over-year -year growth versus last quarter. Second, we continue to focus on connecting the ecosystem. Online services revenue, which includes payments, payroll, time tracking, and capital, grew 17% in fiscal Q1. Within payments, revenue growth reflects continued customer growth, along with an increase in charge volume per customer. Within payroll, we continue to see revenue tailwinds during the quarter from a mixed shift to our full service offering and growth in payroll customers. Third, our progress expanding globally added to the growth of online ecosystem revenue during fiscal Q1. Total international online revenue grew 51%. Desktop ecosystem revenue grew 3% in the first quarter, while QuickBooks desktop enterprise revenue grew mid-single digits. Desktop ecosystem revenue growth also reflects the benefit of additional revenues from license updates and tailwinds from previously announced price increases in various products not fully reflected in the year-ago quarter. We do not expect these tailwinds to recur in future quarters. Consumer group revenue grew 19% in Q1, 
Looking ahead to the upcoming tax season, we continue to focus on our strategy to expand our lead in DIY, transform the assisted segment with TurboTax Live, and disrupt consumer finance. Turning to the ProConnect Group, revenue grew 21% in Q1, in line with our expectations. Let me turn to our acquisition of Credit Karma. I'm looking forward to welcoming the Credit Karma team to Intuit, and we're excited about the unprecedented benefits we can deliver for customers. I want to remind you that we continue to expect the acquisition to be accretive over time. However, Credit Karma's business was negatively impacted over the last seven months as lenders tightened access to credit due to economic uncertainty related to the pandemic. The business continues to recover after reaching a low point in June, with monthly revenue in October close to pre-COVID levels. Therefore, we expect the acquisition to be modestly dilutive to non-GAAP earnings per share in fiscal 2021 and neutral to modestly dilutive to non-GAAP earnings per share in the first full fiscal year after close in fiscal 2022. We're looking forward to all the innovation that we can deliver together for customers. Turning to our financial principles, we remain committed to growing organic revenue double digits and growing operating income dollars faster than revenue. We take a disciplined approach to capital management, investing the cash we generate in opportunities that yield an expected return on investment greater than 15%. We continue to focus on reallocating resources to top priorities with an emphasis on becoming an AI-driven expert platform. These principles remain our long-term commitment, though we recognize that we may not be able to achieve them in the current environment or directly following the close of the Credit Karma transaction. Our first priority for the cash we generate is investing in the business to drive customer and revenue growth. We consider acquisitions to accelerate our growth and fill out our product roadmap. We return excess cash that we can't invest profitably in the business to shareholders via both share repurchases and dividends. We finished the quarter with approximately $5.8 billion in cash and investments on our balance sheet. We expect to use approximately $3.6 billion of cash to fund part of the consideration for the Credit Karma acquisition. We did not repurchase any stock during the first quarter as we temporarily suspended share purchases in conjunction with the Credit Karma acquisition. Approximately $2.4 billion remaining on our authorization, and we expect to be in the market in the future. The board approved a quarterly dividend of $0.59 cents per share, payable January 19, 2021. This represents an 11% increase versus last year. As you may have seen, we reached an agreement to settle the class action litigation regarding the IRS free file program. We have agreed to pay $40 million to put this matter behind us. By entering into this settlement, which is subject to court approval, we're not admitting any wrongdoing. Also, as I shared at Investor Day, Intuit is the target of a law firm whose standard approach seems to involve making a demand that companies pay a settlement amount to the law firm instead of paying fees associated with arbitration. An increasing number of companies are facing similar attacks by the same law firm. We recorded approximately $10 million in arbitration fees for Q1 fiscal 2021 and $14 million in fiscal 2020. We'll be disclosing in our 10Q that Intuit could incur arbitration fees of approximately $400 million related to those claims in future periods. We're in the process of disputing these fees, and we believe this is an abuse of the arbitration system. If the court approves the settlement that I mentioned earlier, we believe it may significantly reduce exposure to mass arbitration claims being brought against us. Moving on to guidance, while macro uncertainty remains, we're growing more confident in how our business is performing in the current environment. Our guidance for fiscal 2021 includes revenue growth of 8 to 10%, gap earnings per share of $7 to $7.15, and non-GAAP earnings per share of $8.40 to $8.55. Our fiscal 2021 guidance includes 110 basis points of operating margin expansion, as we're starting to see the leverage of our platform, which I shared at Investor Day. We expect a GAAP tax rate of 23% and a non-GAAP tax rate of 24% for fiscal 2021. 
This compares to a GAAP tax rate of 17% and a non-GAAP tax rate of 23% for fiscal 2020. These increases are driven primarily by state and IRS changes to the R&D tax credit and expected decrease to our excess tax benefits per share-based compensation. This equates to an impact of 53 cents to our GAAP earnings per share and 11 cents to our non-GAAP earnings per share guidance for the higher tax rate. Our Q2 fiscal 2021 guidance includes revenue growth of 8 to 9 percent, GAAP earnings per share of 89 cents to 92 cents, and non-GAAP earnings per share of $1.31 to $1.34. You can find our full Q2 and fiscal 2021 guidance details in our press release and on our fact sheet. One final note on Q2, we're lapping a full quarter of a price increase in Q2 which we expect to negatively impact small business and self-employed revenue growth by a couple of points. Um, also, shortly after we close the Credit Karma acquisition, we will hold a call to discuss our revised guidance. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Sasan. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, team, I'm very proud uh, of our organization and all that we've accomplished together, and I'm very optimistic about the future. So with that, let's now open it up to your questions. Thank you again to ask a question. Please press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. Again, that's star 1 on your touchtone telephone to ask a question. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Ken Wong of Guggenheim Securities. Your line is open. Great. Th thank you for taking my question and, and a really solid start to the year, guys. Um, when looking at the guidance, uh, specifically the S&B guidance, you know, one might infer that you guys have removed the, the W and double W macro scenarios off the table. Is that the right way to think about it, or is it just purely that your business has held up much better and, you know, the realities are we still may run into those, but if we do, it'll, it'll tilt towards this, this new 8 to 10% lower end? Yeah, hey, Ken, um, good to hear from you. You know, I think the best way I would um, describe it is, um, one, we're actually seeing, you know, how resilient um, our platform is and how small businesses are using our platform uh, in this pandemic. I, I think, two, because of that, it just gives us uh, confidence as, as we look ahead in terms of uh, how small businesses are going to be able to maneuver through this, you know, current uh, environment. So we're you know, primarily going off of the, the key indicators that we see that are both leading and um, lagging. Uh, and that is really what has given us, you know, confidence to provide the, um, the guidance that, uh, that we've given. You know, of course, uh, we'll all have to wait and see how, you know, things play out with the health crisis and the impact of the economic crisis. Uh, but given just what we're seeing uh, in, in our business, uh, that's really what's informed the, um, uh, our guidance that we shared today. Got it. And if I could squeeze on in for Michelle, um, yeah, you mentioned the, the the EBIT guidance is looks like the the margin expansion will be a give or take 100 110 basis points. Um, and you did previously mention seeing more leverage going forward. Is this the the right level of margin expansion that we should be expecting? Um, you know, as we as we look ahead. Hi, Ken. Thanks. Um, you know. Uh, go back to our financial principles. Um, that really is the long-term commitment that we have, and that includes growing revenue double digits and growing operating income faster than revenue. And so, we, as I mentioned, um, yes, we do expect to see 110 basis points of expansion, you know, um, excluding Credit Karma. Um, as I shared at Investor Day, though, you know, as we continue to evolve to more of an AI-driven expert platform, we do see opportunities um, for margin expansion across, um, across the P&L. Um, and those opportunities can be in the areas of technology, where we're increasing the velocity of development on our actual technology platform so we can deliver faster and also using products and services across the company. Um, we also see that in customer success where we're scaling a common customer success platform that drives efficiency and um, effectiveness serving across all products. And then also in go-to-market, um, we're able to leverage a common infrastructure 
so that we can more effectively target um, customers and manage our sales and marketing processes. So we do continue to see um, opportunities for us to expand margin going forward. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> Thank you. Our next question comes from Keith Weiss of Morgan Stanley. Your question, please. Excellent. Um, the first question I was hoping to ask, or I'm not sure if you guys are going to comment on this, was just a current status update on, on your expectations on timing for Credit Karma, number one, and number two, um, whether all the sort of constituent pieces of Credit Karma are expected to come along, because uh, there was some, some um, uh, speculation in the press that they might be selling off their tax business. A a any chance you could comment on, on either of those? Yeah, sure, Keith. Good to hear uh, from you. You know, first of all, we, we do have uh, pretty high confidence that we will close Credit Karma uh, by the end of calendar year. Uh, so that's the first point. I think the second point is, as you know, we, we don't comment on uh, rumors, but it's important to reinforce that uh, the, the, the whole premise behind the Credit Karma acquisition was what we could do together uh, to create a consumer finance platform, and it wasn't for mm -hmm. Uh, the tax business, and so I think I will just leave it at that. But nevertheless, we're really excited and um, can't wait to close this uh, so we can start doing amazing things together for consumers. Got it. If I could maybe sneak in one last one, since that, that last one's like half of an answer. Um, in the, the the broader platform within SMB, when you're going into um, stuff like cash, when you're trying to do more of the, the commerce back end, um, how is this changing your competitive environment? And is, is, have you seen a, a significant sort of change in kind of uh, who you're going up against or sort of how you have to position the, the solutions for um, these, these, new, these newer solutions? Yeah. Hey, Keith, thanks for calling me out, buddy. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of your question, you know, it, it's uh, interesting timing. Uh, our we had QuickBooks Connect yesterday, which which is where we have you know thousands of small businesses and accountants and partners together. And of course, this one was uh, far far bigger than it ever has been because it was all virtual. And we rolled out a lot of our innovations, but particularly um, to answer your question, we also rolled out QuickBooks Commerce and QuickBooks Cash to our to our customer base, or at least gave visibility and, and awareness, and uh, the feedback was just through the roof. Because you know, if I start with accountants, accountants were very excited because now you know they can recommend QuickBooks to product-based businesses, and they loved um, uh, how QuickBooks Commerce uh, works for product-based businesses, and they love the fact that they can, uh, in essence, uh, help a small business run their business uh, through the the platform. And two small businesses uh, that were product-based businesses, they, they love commerce. And by the way, they we got a raving reviews on QuickBooks Cash because it's just a, a simple app where you can send and receive uh, money to be able to, to run your business. And so I, I would say from a positioning standpoint, uh, we're not doing anything differently uh, in, in terms of going up against others. What we're really focused on is the customer problem and how we're raising awareness. And in fact, our team has done some great work, uh, and in, in the months and the year ahead, what you'll see is, you know, we'll be, you know, in essence, going to market with digital assets that helps uh, small businesses understand that we can truly be the source of truth for their entire business versus the source of truth for their books and from an accounting lens. And so it's more about what we're doing to raise awareness and shape the market versus doing anything differently given who we're going up against, because it's frankly, it's, you know, no different than what it's been in the past. Okay. Got it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Michael Turin of WF Securities. Your line is open. Hey there. Um, thanks for taking the question. Uh, appreciate it. On, on, on guidance um, and the decision to bring that back, um, obviously the bigger focus now is on small business. But looking ahead to tax, I mean, you previously mentioned tough comps from the strong top of funnel activity you saw last year, still guiding for 9 to 10% growth as a starting point there this year. Can you just help maybe frame out the base case there and, and maybe your confidence around ability to, to further monetize that uptick you saw this past year? Yeah, sure, Michael. Uh, very good to hear from you. You know, first of all, as, as we talked about last quarter, you know, our – you know, our biggest uncertainty was around the macro environment and the impact of small businesses and, and uh, you know, how our platform would, would perform uh, in, in the times of uncertainty. So we've just learned 
a ton. Uh, one, all the credit to small businesses in terms of just their uh, their passion to do whatever it takes to survive. But then two, you know, uh, us better understanding how they use the platform uh, to be able to deliver for customers. And so, given that, uh, and given uh, that you know we uh, started experiencing businesses opening across the company, and our confidence, you know, is at a, is at an improved level than it was a quarter ago. With that said, uh, to your question around uh, tax, you know, we're bullish about our strategy and, and you know, we've, we've continued to be bullish based on the results that we're seeing. And particularly, it's uh, driven by two primary areas. You know, one is who we focus on, and then the second is the how. The who we focus on is, you know, all, we've doubled down several years ago on serving uh, investors, serving self-employed, and serving the Latinx market, all of which we are underpenetrated. And then two, really uh, going after the market, the assisted market, and those that are looking for more confidence with TurboTax Live. Uh, and so although our comps compared to last year um, are tough comps, uh, we do have confidence in our execution, our trajectory, and that's really what informed the, uh, the guidance that we provided. Got it. That's all clear. Certainly a nice start to the year. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jennifer Lowe of UBS. Your line is open. Great. Uh, thank you. I wanted to drill down on the international growth because of the 51% was a pretty impressive number, and I think at Analyst Day, um, you know, you exited fiscal 20 with around 14% growth in subs, um, obviously pricing has been a pretty strong level. So can you just maybe break down or, or sort of decompose the components of that 51% growth, how much of that is potentially an improvement in the subscriber count that you're seeing there versus just continued success on pricing initiatives? Yeah, hi, Jennifer. Uh, good to hear from you. You know, it's, it's both. Very consistent with what we shared um, at, uh, at Investor Day. You know, we continue to see, you know, strength in, in the U.K. Uh, and Canada, uh, and uh, we're, we're seeing some of the emerging markets that we're focused on, uh, like Brazil and, and France, uh, really start um, their acceleration even in, in this current environment. And so really, it, it's a combination of being very focused on who we pursue, with what products we pursue, and then also really intentional about uh, pricing, uh, and frankly, a lot less um, discounting, especially in places like Canada and UK, where we, you know, have created a network effect with um, small businesses using us, recommending us, with accountants using us and recommending us, and so we, you know, we don't have to discount as much to get our names known. So it's, it's very similar to what we talked about, which is it's a combination of customer growth and ARPC growth, and the ARPC growth is, you know, a lot to do with what we're selling and uh, and a lot less uh, discounting. Great, and maybe just one more for me. Um, so, you know, a, a little while ago over the summer, you know, as, as the world was changing with COVID-19, uh, you, like many other companies, took some actions to, to sort of, you know, de-emphasize some of the less growthy businesses and then, you know, plan to bring back that headcount over time um, in some of the, the grossier parts of the business. And I'm just curious, you know, where you are in that process at this point and maybe specific to the margin guidance you know, what's the assumption of the pace of getting back into the hiring groove on your business and cost structure? Yeah, sure. You know, just for a, a quick uh, context, you know, there are a couple of areas where we felt like we needed to double down in context of the bets that, uh, that we've declared. You know, it's the type of talent um, that we're pursuing both in, in creating a modern operations and our customer success, but also uh, the type of experts that we want to bring into customer success. And then, and, you know, in technology, it was more systems engineers, infrastructure engineers, uh, cloud engineers that have lots of experience in, you know, building complex systems uh, in the cloud. Uh, and we are aggressively hiring in, in those areas because they ultimately are very important in serving uh, the best that, uh, that I talked about earlier and a lot of our innovation that we've been talking about, like commerce, cash, advance, uh, et cetera. So, uh, we feel good about you know the our our hiring ramp and and I think I would just really focus on the guidance that Michelle talked about, which includes about a hundred and ten basis points of margin expansion uh, and all of our uh, approach to hiring is is all embedded in the guidance that we provided. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Sterling Odie of J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. 
just one question from my side. You talked about the uh, headwind from renewal rates from previous quarter impacted this quarter's revenue. Uh, can you just give us an update? What did you see in terms of renewal rates through this quarter uh, in the small business franchise? Yeah, they're, they're actually the, the tailwinds or the headwinds are in three buckets. Uh, one is uh, overall, as we shared at Investor Day, our uh, retention dropped by a couple of points based on you know what we saw in the you know, March, April, May timeframe. Uh, that, along with lapping a price increase and actually not taking price action deliberately, uh, plus the impact from acquisitions in those same months is really what impacted our uh, our growth rates. Uh, for the quarter that you see here. And our view is that the second quarter uh, will be probably the, the lowest point uh, of the year for the small business group for the same exact uh, reasons that I just mentioned. As you know, we don't break out quarterly um, attrition and retention rates. We share it once a, uh, once a year at Investor Day. So those are the main drivers of it. That makes sense. Thank you, guys. You're very welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brent Thale of Jeffries. Your line is open. Thanks. Uh, Sasan, if you could just talk about the, the shape of the recovery in SMB that you're seeing and the conviction level you have that that continues, can you just give us a sense of how are you seeing that progress? And then I just had a quick follow-up. Um, you were showing uh, the TurboTax uh, full opportunity set on your website. You removed it. It seems really interesting, you know, uh, in terms of the opportunity to outsource everything to to you. Um, can you just walk through your your intentions for that, that solution this year? Thanks. Yeah, sure, Brent. Good to hear from you. In terms of the shape of the, the recovery, it's actually quite consistent with what we shared at Investor Day. Uh, you know, may, most of our indicators are back to uh, pre-pandemic levels, but, you know, charge volume is still uh, you know, several points lower. The number of companies running payroll is still several points uh, lower. So although things have recovered, um, the reality is things are still below pre-pandemic levels. I think where we have more confidence, uh, Brent, is now we are actually seeing how our platform is uh, uh, really how resilient it is and how it's delivering benefits for customers in these very tough times, plus the innovation that we have uh, across the uh, the platform. So just seeing how our platform is playing out and seeing the impact of our innovation is actually what gives us even uh, more confidence. And from a recovery standpoint, not much has changed, you know, in the last six weeks and what we shared uh, at Investor Day. Uh, to turn to your second uh, question, you know, we're, we're actually, you know, when you think about transforming the assisted segment uh, and really helping customers do their taxes, you know, with confidence, um, you know, there are those that choose to do it themselves, but uh, at one point in time, they may, you know, want to you know, hit a button and get um, an expert to come talk to them, review their return to gain confidence. To so those that from the beginning uh, may choose to have help uh, along the way and pick TurboTax Live as an actual offering right off the bat. And then there are those that may start and decide, you know what, I just want you to do my taxes uh, for me, which is just a lot of what we were uh, testing uh, in the uh, in the last several months. And our plan is to actually launch the platform with all of those capabilities uh, come uh, this coming tax season, which, by the way, is right around the corner. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brent. Thank you. Our next question comes from Siti Panagrahi of Mizuho. Your line is open. Thanks for taking my question. Um, uh, I just want to ask about you know, trends you are seeing in terms of new customer acquisition, because we saw this recent Q3 data, census data, there's record number of small business creation. And in Q3, I think 1.6 million versus average of 800,000. So I guess most of these could be potentially QuickBook customer. So how should we think about this opportunity and the current trend of this new customer acquisition? Yeah, City, uh, good to hear from you and, and a really good question. You know, as I mentioned, there are a few of our key metrics that have recovered quite nicely, but they're still below the, the pre-COVID levels like charge volume and, and payroll. Uh, acquisition is one that's actually um, rebounded, you know, quite nicely, uh, and, um, and we're actually benefiting from uh, some of what you uh, shared, which is uh, more new business uh, formation. So, 
that's probably a metric um, above and beyond all of them that is probably more in the green, uh, and we're benefiting from some of that recovery. That's great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brad Zelnick of Credit Suisse. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. This is Yawan for Brad. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, it's a little bit specific, but also philosophical here. Um, and it's around QuickBooks Commerce uh, and the specific topic of discounting. I understand it's a new solution and you want mass market adoption, but when I go to the website, it shows 92% off the monthly list price for the first 12 months of service. I've never seen anything like that in software before. I guess what's the thought process here, especially as it sounds like you're being more thoughtful around optimizing for discounts in other areas of your business? Yeah, sure, Yao. Um, good to hear from you and, and very good question. Um, two, two things I, I would say. Uh, one is uh, we are actually very intentionally qualifying customers at the top of the funnel uh, to ensure that we only bring in customers that we can I deliver uh, against their expectations given just we literally just launched the, the platform. Interesting enough, one thing that we're seeing is customer wanna, customers want to use it so bad they go back to the top of the funnel and change their answers so they can qualify for it. So the demand is quite high. I think you may have fallen into one of our test cells. There's a lot of different things that we're testing, different business models, different pricing. So uh, I don't exactly know what you fell into, but uh, it sounds like you fell into a test cell. Got it. Thank you. Um, the other bit, I guess, around the 9 to 10%, I'm sorry, the, the QuickBooks and uh, small business growth scenario there, just thinking about exogenous factors that may result in upside or downside, does uh, uh, you know, a hypothetical government stimulus package, uh, how does that help churn or business creation, how to think about that flowing through to your model? Yeah, you know, the, the stimulus, I, I would say, uh, no pun intended, is not really going to be a big stimulus for uh, small businesses. It's not going to make the difference between, you know, them going out of business or not. I, I'll hit on one element of your question, which is, you know, the, the range of the guidance. You know, the low end of the guidance uh, is, is really driven from, uh, you know, how uh, restrictive the states becomes, how restrictive the country becomes, uh, you know, beyond what we're all uh, seeing, which is, you now no longer, although every X state is a little different, you no longer can go into a fitness center. It's only if it's outside. You can't go eat inside at all. Uh, now schools like the New York public schools just closed again, so everybody has to go from home. That has implications for the local economy. So the, the low end of the guidance is more you know, how restrictive things get and then the impact on, on small businesses because we feel quite confident in our execution. And, of course, the high end is, you know, the – I would say this, the, you know, the trends that we're experiencing and seeing right now. That's how we thought about it. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, very welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Arvin Romani of Piper Sandler. Your line is open. Uh, uh, thank, thanks for taking my uh, th thanks for taking my questions. No, I, I just wanted to um, you know, one of, one of the, the tone changes I picked up at your um, Recent, uh, recent uh, analyst day was, um, uh, you know, kind of really focusing on increasing, uh, you know, revenue per customer. Uh, you know, I just want to see if, if that was, uh, you know, kind of something something that you're looking to do to really uh, increase uh, revenue per customer and, and um, you know, how, how you're planning to approach it over the next couple of years. Sure. Ar Arvind, um, good to hear from you. Let me just play back your question because you were cutting in and out. I want to make sure I'm answering the question that you're asking. I think your question was we talked about uh, revenue per customer uh, increasing at Investor Day, and you were just wondering you know, how we plan to achieve that. Did I play that back correctly? Yes, yes. Okay. yes. Great. You, you know, I would say uh, a couple of Uber messages. The first one is it's because of the incredible innovation and the acceleration of the innovation uh, from the team that's really going after delivering benefits that, that customers care about most. So if I decompose that uh, to, with a couple of uh, examples, you know, what I would share is, you know, QuickBooks Live uh, is, you know, has the potential uh, to uh, increase revenue per customer. The volume is not, of course, at the same rate, but the, the revenue per customer is. When you look at QuickBooks Advance, uh, which, uh, you know, comes with it serving much larger customers, 
Uh, that has an opportunity uh, and does move the needle when it comes to revenue per customer. And then there's the services, uh, the services that go with Cookbooks Live, the services that go with uh, Cookbooks Advance. And then within all the services that we provide, payments, payroll, uh, T-sheets, uh, and, and now with the integration of T-sheets and payroll with uh, payroll full service, these services um, and the innovation and the impact uh, themselves also deliver um, more revenue per, per customer. So when you put all of those uh, together, uh, those are the biggest drivers of increased revenue uh, per customer, which is just driven by the innovations that the team uh, is uh, delivering for customers. Great. Uh, terrific. And just a quick uh, uh, second question for me. Uh, you know, how transformative is your, is your relatively new uh, integrated CRM solution? Uh, should we expect this to be a big revenue growth driver, um, or is it just another proof point of uh, differentiated offering? I, I think it's just another important innovation um, and uh, benefit uh, for customers on our QuickBooks Advanced platform. Again, when you think about these customers, because I'm assuming you're talking about like HubSpot and, and Salesforce, and yep. um, and you know these customers that are between 10 to 100 employees and, and even larger than that, they are looking for for CRM solutions. So we invested. Uh, quite a bit of uh, time uh, with, I'll use HubSpot as an example, to really deeply integrate. In fact, I was reviewing the demo uh, several days ago, and it's a really cool experience for our customers. So this is, it just positions us and allows us uh, to not only serve our existing customers with QuickBooks Advance, but also penetrate and get uh, new customers. Great. Uh, uh, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Scott Schneeberger of Oppenheimer. Your question, please. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, I was hoping, uh, Sasan or myself, if you could elaborate, please, on the uh, the mix shift driving in, uh, in QuickBooks Online Accounting. If you could delve in a little deeper, primary drivers and sustainability you foresee there. Thanks. Uh, sure, Scott. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, and if there's anything Michelle wants to add, she can jump in. You know, it's very similar to what I just shared with Arvin. First of all, I'll start with the headline of it's very sustainable. We're just getting started. Uh, and when you when you look at um, the the mix, it gets driven by the platform with QuickBooks Live. It gets uh, another one is QuickBooks uh, Advance, and both of these come with them services like payments and payroll and uh, and T sheets. And then apps like um, HubSpot is an example that allows us to uh, drive uh, a mix shift. And so those are just examples. Uh, and then QuickBooks Commerce, which really gives us the opportunity to serve product-based businesses that, that we've served for years in desktop, the million product-based businesses that we have on desktop. Now we have an opportunity to serve these customers with QuickBooks Commerce. So those are the, the, the drivers. And then the last one I would say is countries where we get the product market fit, like Canada and UK. Uh, we have an opportunity to expand the services that we provide uh, and at, a, at higher prices and don't have to discount as much because uh, our names are out there, the experience goes viral, uh, and therefore more customers want to use it. So those are the drivers of the mix shift and the ARPC shift, and that's uh, quite durable. Great, thanks for that. And then as a follow-up, I'm just curious, um, j just for viewpoints on, on small business failures, um, obviously, you feel confident enough to give guidance, and we've heard a lot of good things in discussion of stimulus as well. Um, but just anecdotally, what are some of the things that you're seeing, and uh, do you feel that you know the 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 economy is around the corner uh, to the to the extent you can speak to that? Thanks. Sure. You know, two things I would say. I, I think the most important um, lever. Uh, for small businesses is we got to lead thoughtfully through this health crisis uh, because leading thoughtfully through the health crisis uh, will enable uh, the country and the globe uh, to actually bring jobs back uh, and reduce unemployment. Those are the two largest levers that will impact uh, small business uh, failures. And as we talked about at Investor, they are re our um, retention dropped a couple of points because of the failures you know, that, we, uh, that we experienced. Uh, I think those two levers that I mentioned plus a fiscal stimulus, not just more stimulus money, but a fiscal stimulus uh, along with getting out of this health crisis uh, and ultimately getting back to lower unemployment is, is going to really drive the long-term health of uh, small businesses. 
Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kurt Return of Evercore. Your line is open. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, Sasan, I was wondering if you could dive a little bit deeper into the sort of announcement today with HubSpot and maybe just your view on whether or not you know, small businesses are now looking a little bit more for a one-stop shop. I mean, you guys obviously have financials, you're at commerce, and this obviously you know, expands you into CRM and marketing with them. So is the feedback that you've been getting that this is, you know, look, we want to only deal with one vendor to, to really help us manage our business from customer acquisition through our finances, through commerce? I mean, because that, that's what it sort of seems like, and do you think the market's moving there in a faster way due to COVID? Thanks. Yeah, you're very welcome. You know, the, I, I, would, uh, I would focus more on the customer pain that we are after. You know, what, one of the things that we're really focused on is, uh, one, to help our customers grow, uh, and two, uh, to be able to serve product-based businesses. Because even in service-based businesses, you know, traditionally we've not solved the problem of helping them grow and get more customers well. And so this uh, integration, you know, with HubSpot, you know, with Salesforce, is really an example of solving the problem of with our platform, uh, we can help you grow your business. We can help you get paid. We can help you do payroll. We can give you access to capital. We can help you with time tracking. Of course, now we can help you, you know, set up on multiple different channels uh, and be able to run your product-based business. So we're really focused on the customer problem. And one of the things I preach probably more than that work wants to hear it, add into it is, you know, let, let's not focus on just creating a one-stop shop because that's not how a customer thinks. The customer thinks, I need to solve my problem. Can you solve it for me? With that said, we are seeing more and more, you know, customers begin to use our platform to be able to run their business. And we're seeing more and more customers tell us, hey, you know, can you do some integrations with the, the, the following applications to be able to help me grow my business? So those are the – it's very customer-back driven – and, you know, it's, it's now, you know, several years of us being in the cloud where we're building up the platform to the point where you don't need to go anywhere else. You can run your entire business on our platform, which is exactly the same thing we're looking to do on the consumer side. We want a consumer platform where you can do your taxes, get early access to your paycheck, connect the financial products that are right for you, and truly reach uh, financial freedom. Uh, and so it really it's, it's consistent with what we're trying to do across the company for customers. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kartik Mehta of North Coast Research. Your line is open. Michelle, how are you? Susan, you've talked about uh, QuickBooks business and not raising prices, obviously, considering the economic environment we're in. Do you think that same philosophy will apply to the tax business, or is the tax business different, and do you think there's some different leverage points and uh, price would be available for the upcoming season? Yep, uh, Carter, good to hear, you know, from you. You know, I, I, I would think about this in a couple of dimensions. You know, both MERS and small businesses, we actually now have offerings that are disruptive, and they disrupt higher price alternatives. So when you look at QuickBooks Live, um, the, the price that customers have to pay with QuickBooks Live uh, is actually a lot less than uh, what they pay with if they have to go directly and find their own, you know, bookkeeper or enrolled agent. Uh, and you look at QuickBooks Advanced, you know, we are, uh, we're actually at a disruptive price, but yet have a lot of opportunity uh, in terms of what we can do with pricing. Same thing goes for TurboTax Live. You know, we're a much uh, lower cost alternative um, than going to, you know, somebody's, you know, home or store to get your taxes done. So I think the way I would, I would think about it is there are segments of customers we may uh, intentionally, given the environment, not do price increases, but then there are certain segments of the customers where we will because we're actually very disruptive and far lower price alternatives. So that's the way we approach it and think about it internally. Thanks, Hassan. Uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chris Merwin of Goldman Sachs. Your question, please. Okay, thanks very much for taking my question. 
Um, I think you all talked about uh, the online ecosystem getting back to 30% growth over time. And I guess if we, if we look at the 21 guidance for, for the segment as a whole, and we assume desktop is, is flat, I think it would imply that um, QuickBooks uh, Online would be maybe high teens growth for, for, for this coming year. Uh, it sounds like the trends are very much getting back on track for, for QuickBooks uh, Online. So just curious how we think about the progression back towards 30% you know, plus growth uh, over time for that segment. Thanks. Yeah, sure, Chris. You know, first of all, as, as um, you heard Michelle mention, you know, our we have every intention over time to get to back to uh, thirty percent plus online uh, revenue growth, and uh, and that will happen really by two levers. One is our continued innovation to deliver uh, value uh, and the portfolio we now have, and two, uh, it's the recovery of small businesses, although. You know, our platform has demonstrated to be resilient. It's important to know that, you know, we're not out of this pandemic. And, uh, and we need to make sure that we get through this health crisis and, you know, get unemployment back, back down and, and get to a, you know, a more healthy economy. And I think the combination of our innovation and getting to a better place in terms of the economy will allow us to get back to that 30%. And, uh, and a lot of that is what informs the guidance that we, uh, that we provided. Okay, great. Thank you. And then maybe one just quick follow-up. I uh, wanted to ask about QuickBooks Advanced, just in terms of how that's doing relative your, to your expectations in the current environment. Are, are you seeing customers holding back on some of the larger system upgrades, um, say, relative to, to SMB? I mean, or, or, or is that not the case? Just, just curious how you'd characterize the, 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 the strength you're seeing in that business right now. Yeah, I would say it's actually doing well. You know, at Investor Day, if you recall, we talked about now we have 75,000 customers, and that's 100% growth year over year. Uh, and uh, and we're seeing both, you know, customers upgrade uh, to QuickBooks Advance uh, that are existing customers, and we're actually seeing new customers come in uh, that have been, you know, using a bunch of different um, apps and manual processes, and, and they use QuickBooks Advance, and they see it as an advantage to be able to grow their business. So, we're actually, um, and because it's disruptive in terms of price versus alternatives, uh, we are not seeing any holdbacks, and uh, we're actually, you know, seeing the benefit of what a, a platform can do that's a disruptor, especially those small businesses that are, you know, deciding, you know what, me manually running my business is no longer going to work. I need to move to the cloud, uh, especially because of the COVID environment, and QuickBooks Advance becomes a, an accelerant. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Very welcome. Thank you. Our next question comes from Michael Millman of Millman Research. Your question, please. Thank you. So if I've done the numbers roughly correct, there's about 100 million taxpayers who pay about a quarter of a trillion, that's a, with a T like TurboTax, dollars for no or zero return. I was kind of wondering uh, this kind of Opportunity, maybe, uh, for you. Uh, what, what if anything, you're doing now to get some of this money funneled into something that's earning, uh, or is, uh, car, uh, comma credit, credit comma doing anything? Uh, it, does the IRS kind of stand up there and say, "Don't you dare fool with all this money"? Maybe you can help us think about this. Uh, sure, Michael. Yeah, you know, let me let me take a shot at this to see uh, if this addresses your your question. First of all, we do see a very large opportunity, but the way we uh, look at it is that um, there are about 86 million people that go to somebody else to have their taxes done, and and they spend about you know 20 billion dollars or more uh, to get those taxes done. We just see a huge opportunity to be able to serve uh, those customers with a digital platform where we can bring the help to their um, you know, place of home or office uh, at their convenience at a much lower price and provide them the confidence that they need to get the maximum refund. So we do see the same opportunity that, 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 that you do. Our figures are a bit different than what you were articulating, but that's, uh, that's really what we are pursuing with our live uh, platform. I, I was actually kind of thinking of no refund. Don't pay more than you need to. Uh, invest that money. Oh, got you. I, I think I understand what you're asking. You know, the, the whole purpose of uh, our vision uh, of what, we're, what we want to do to create a consumer finance platform is to give cons consumers choice. It's to give them choice to 
you know, connect to financial products like loans and insurance and credit cards that are right for them. Uh, it's to be able to give them choice when they get their tax refund, if they want to put it in a high-yield savings account, uh, if they want early access to their tax refund, if they actually want early access to their, to their paycheck, uh, to give them more choice because, you know, we have the ability with using their data with their permission uh, to give them insights uh, that otherwise they wouldn't get. Plus, by the way, if they wanted an expert to help them, we'll provide some advice. We could also help them with that. That's our vision of what we want to uh, what we want to do with our big bet three, which is unlock smart money decisions. And of course, that's where Credit Karma comes in and can really fuel that uh, that vision. And we're excited about it. So you're thinking more of after the after taxpayers get uh, the refund, rather than saying you shouldn't there shouldn't be a refund. You should be you. Uh, using that money more productively than lending it to the IRS. Yeah. Well, well, the refund is the consumer's money. So what we're the, it's, a, it's money that that's theirs and and they earned it and and they should get their refund. It's about how we help the consumer with what they can do with their refund is really our our mission. I see. Okay. And just quickly, the the guidance you gave that is before Credit Karma, or does that include Credit Karma? Yes, that is excluding Credit Karma because we have not yet closed Credit Karma. And as Michelle mentioned, once we do close Credit Karma, we will actually have another call and we will update our guidance and it will include Credit Karma. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Be safe. Thank you. You too. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not showing any further questions. Would you like to close with any additional remarks? Yes, uh, I'll be brief. Thank you, everyone, for your questions, uh, and uh, wish everyone that celebrates Thanksgiving a wonderful and safe Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll speak to you very soon, uh, and uh, enjoy your holidays. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating, and this concludes today's conference call.